and conflict. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on The Line of Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks so much for joining us on The Line of Fire. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, urge us to be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, is going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It is always important for us as followers of Jesus to be sober and vigilant, to be living serious lives in the midst of a serious world where there is serious pain and suffering every day, where there is serious rebellion, where there is serious redemption taking place. We should always have a certain holy sobriety about us, but all the more as the earth is shaking, all the more as there is the real potential of the war in Israel exploding on an international level, if Iran gets involved, if America gets involved on a greater level, all the more should we be living with sobriety in the midst of the spiritual battle. Michael Brown, welcome to the broadcast, 866-34-TRUTH for the number to call. I'm going to get into some controversial uh, subjects today. If you differ with my position, if you don't believe that Israel has a right to be in the land today, if you believe that Israel is some type of colonizer or evil occupier, I'm hoping later in the broadcast to be able to get to some dissenting calls if time permits and if folks are willing to call 866-34-TRUTH. We are going to go through history today we are going to look at the last 140, 50 years. We're going to look at key events, key players. This is going to be very helpful for you. Then you go research, check out what I'm saying as much as you can to verify the points that I'm making. I want to say one thing clearly, though, to everyone, as I invite you to join us together on the front lines. If you're watching on YouTube, please click share, give it a thumbs up. If you this is a show you want to be in on and click share. If you're watching on Facebook, click share and like. We want to reach as many as we can. Again, everyone listening via podcast, via radio, tell a friend, text them if you can, tune in to the broadcast. I just finished recording a broadcast with an Orthodox rabbi in Israel whose kids are on the front lines of the battle. That is going to air on Thursday. That's been recorded it's a, it's a must hear from the land with some really fascinating and chilling spiritual insights and perspectives. But I, I want to give you a little bigger perspective, and then we're going to cover a lot of ground today. I watched in 1999 a, a video called God Fights Back. Actually, I saw it on PBS, Public Broadcasting System, and subsequently got the video, God Fights Back. And it was about the rise of religious fundamentalism worldwide, beginning in the late 1970s in Iran. The Islamic fundamentalism then comes over to America. Christian fundamentalism, the contrast is, is very intense, very eye-opening to watch on many levels. But what got my attention was this, that Ayatollah Khomeini had been exiled by the Shah of Iran and was in France. And here he, in France, he would record messages. He was not an emotional preacher. He was a very austere leader. He would record his messages against the Shah and against the westernization and secularization of Iran. The, the cassette tapes would then be smuggled into Iran, duplicated, and given over to the, to the mullahs, to the, to the different preachers in the mosques. They would turn his messages into their Friday sermons. It incited the Islamic community, it radicalized the Islamic community, and the Shah, despite the, the strong arm with which he led in his savak, the secret police and all this, the Shah had to flee for his life because of this Islamic uprising before Khomeini even arrived in the country and set up the Islamic Republic, which continues today in the nation of Iran. And I've always thought about that reality. That, that was words of destruction. Yeah, he may have rightly critiqued aspects of the Shah's regime and, and aspects of the worldliness of the people, but his radical Islamic message has obviously brought massive bloodshed and oppression with it. But I've never forgotten that, that it was his messages recorded on cassette tape, smuggled into Iran, duplicated, that fueled the revolution. 
I have known in terms of my own calling as a child of God, we each have our distinct calling and purpose, that, that, that we are to be part of a holy revolution, that we are to be part of a gospel-based revolution, one that, that pushes back against the insanity of the hour, one that overcomes evil with good, that overcomes hatred with love, that overcomes lies with truth, that overcomes the power of the flesh with the power of the spirit. And I've always had that image of the messages circulating, other people taking them in. There are pastors and leaders around America who'll take the articles we write and the things we talk about in the line of fire, digest them, and then pour some of that truth out to their congregants as we stand arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder. We'll hear from folks who are in school on the campuses that what we're, we're pouring out is enabling them to stand strong. Moms homeschooling their kids, this is just what I needed to hear. This is what we hear. I want to invite you, friends, there is a holy movement taking place, and this is a holy moment, and it is absolutely critical that we help educate America right now and the nations. I want to illustrate this for you. Here's a headline on the Daily Mail, a poll that was done exclusively by the Daily Mail, and it it came with, it it got some striking, shocking conclusions. The headline says this, one in 10 members of Gen Z and young millennials have a positive view of Hamas terrorists, according to an exclusive poll. One in 10 have a positive view after everything that Hamas has done, all the atrocities. And then when you look at the actual data from the poll, it is absolutely shocking. 18 to 29 year olds are the only group to have a negative overall view of Israel. There were four in 10 who did not have a negative view of Hamas. I, I mean, it's, the, the data is shocking. Why? Because people are hearing one narrative, because people are hearing one side. And Gen Z and millennials, who, who often have a great sense of empathy, and they want to see justice, and they are siding against uh, the oppressor, and they want to stand with the oppressed, so they'll, they'll be with the LGBTQ community, and they'll be with the racial minority. There are many things in this that are, that are admirable, but the lies they're being fed, the misinformation they're being fed, the wrong ideologies that they're being bombarded for, in some cases almost out of the womb, have colored their thinking so that Israel is the evil one, and, and that the Palestinians are the victims. There are Palestinians who are victims, we understand that, but that the narrative is completely shifted. Uh, I want to put a map up for everyone to see. This is slide three on our PowerPoint. I want to put a map up, and then I'm going to talk through everyone that's listening. I know the vast majority of you are listening, not watching, but uh, this map shows you Israel in the Middle East, and it's Israel in the world in which it is, so uh, Africa to, to to the south and to the west, and then you've got other countries, Iran, Iraq, and Turkey, etc., as you go to the north and, and to the east. And Israel is in red. It's this tiny sliver. You couldn't even see it. You couldn't even see it, friends, and, unless it was highlighted in red, surrounded by nation after nation after nation after nation. And in this map, the color green represents Islam. It's not entirely accurate, but the vast majority of these surrounding nations are Islamic, the, the vast majority, and some of them radically so. And you get this tiny, tiny, tiny little slice that's Israel, and yet it's somehow, friends, been turned around as if Israel is dominating the entire region and, and swallowing up land and swallowing up people and committing genocide against the Palestinians. It is simply a false narrative. It is turning everything upside down. So we're going to get into some of the history. Why do you think college campuses, campus after campus after campus, has so much hostility towards Israel? Yes, it's the ongoing irrationality of anti-Semitism. That remains. That's true. But it's because Israel has been painted as this evil monster committing genocide, guilty of ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. And I I just saw another headline. I mean, it's, it's ironic beyond words. Uh, You you have students from Harvard University, 31 different student groups, put out uh, put out letters saying that the atrocities that Hamas committed against the people of Israel, slaughtering 1,300, 
We don't have to go through the details once again, but overwhelming, sickening numbers that it was all Israel's fault, that the responsibility is 100 percent on Israel. Of course, the statements have been widely condemned and others saying we're not going to hire. Let's find out who those kids are that sign those statements. We won't hire them as CEOs in our companies. Let's blacklist them. Well, I see a headline now that they are asking for donations to help with mental health support because of the overwhelming emotional attacks coming their way. First thing I would say is grow up. If you're going to put out stuff like that, if you're going to dish it out, you have to be willing to take it. I dish stuff out here all the time in terms of my convictions and laying things out. I, I try to do it graciously and accurately, obviously, but I know if I dish it out, I'm going to get attacked coming back. Let it be. Bring it on. So be it. Lie about me, slander me, misrepresent me, misquote me, whatever. Malign me. Do it. It's, I'm on the front lines. So be it. If you're going to dish it out, you're going to take it. Secondly, the bigger thing Here's how the problems will all go away. And here's how your mental and emotional health will be greatly enhanced. What you do is this. Say, we posted an idiotic, ridiculous, insensitive, and historically inaccurate statement. Please forgive us. We have been rightly informed. Of course we care about the suffering of the Palestinians right now. Of course we care about the suffering of the innocent civilians in Gaza. But... Forgive us for that foolhardy statement. We now see and know and understand better, and we are growing and will become better for it. And you'll get an outpouring of sympathy. More than that, doing the right thing will help your emotional health. All right, friends, we do not have any big guy that underwrites our ministry. My needs are met. Our team's needs are met. Our, our team needs are met. Our staff, our needs are met. But we are burning to expand, to multiply tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold to get this message out to more people. You, the little guy, the average person, you're the ones helping us do it. If you are not part of our support team, join in now. We've never done this before, but everyone signing up as a torchbearer, we're giving you four free books immediately, including Our Hands Are Stained With Blood and Christian Antisemitism, some of the most eye-opening books you'll ever read. Take a moment now, go to askdrbrown.org. If you care about touching this generation and getting the truth out, let's stand together. The harvest is ripe, the doors are open. With your help, we are gonna shake this nation. We're gonna do it together, arm in arm, side by side. Right now, go to askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org. Click donate, monthly support. Join our Torchbearer team together we're making a difference. Jesus, Yeshua, is being exalted in many, many lives. Back to history when we come back. This is Michael Ellison, founder of Trivita Wellness. I want to introduce our Trivita Alfred Libby original patented sublingual B12, B6, and folate formula. I had the wonderful opportunity of meeting Alfred Libby a pioneer in vitamin research. I also had the opportunity to obtain the patented formula and the rest is history with over 50 million tablets being taken by our Trivita members through the years. The amazing testimonies of mental clarity, mood enhancement, and more energy have been thrilling to me as a founder of Trivita Wellness. Not only is it an amazing B12 product, but it is loaded with the essential B6 vitamin. I call it the workhorse vitamin. It is vital for strong immune function and every body system. Here's what the National Center for Biotechnology Information says, and I quote, it plays a key role and is crucial to immune function. It is a molecule necessary for the proper functioning of the entire body system and its role cannot be overestimated. Harvard Medical School of Health says folate is the natural form of vitamin B9, and it plays a key role in breaking down homocysteine, an amino acid that can exert harmful effects on the body when it is present in high amounts. I encourage you today to try the Trivita Libby 
B12, B6, and Folate Formula. To order Alfred Libby's B12 for yourself, call 1-800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. Order today and use promo code BROWN25 to receive 25% off your order. As a new customer, 100% of your order proceeds from your first order will go to support the Line of Fire radio broadcast. 1-800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thank you to our co-sponsor, Trivita, who continues to pour resources into this broadcast to reach more people. Thank you for standing with us, and thank you for putting out these amazing products, which, yes, are part of my daily routine. Healthy diet, exercise, and these supplements, part of my daily routine. So take advantage of this, friends. 800-771-5584. You don't need to use the code when you call in. They know exactly who you are at that number. Glad to answer your questions online, trivita.com. Use the code BROWN25. It gives you the 25% discount plus 100% of your first order and a substantial part of all subsequent orders donated to the line of fire. All right, so... We have talked about, in recent weeks, who Hamas is. But Rabbi Pesach Waliki, who you'll hear from on Thursday, sent me a video. He was part of putting this out just to remind people who Hamas is. And then we're going to go back through history a little bit and see what the conflict is, where it arose. Let me say plainly that I do not exonerate the current government in Israel or the nation of Israel for, for years and decades, do not fully exonerate, do not say Israel has done things perfectly. If you have God's heart, you care for Palestinians, you care for Israelis. Yes? If you have God's heart, you care for a Jewish baby and an Arab baby, a Muslim baby, Christian baby. You, you care for people the same way. We're all created in the image of God. And if Israel does something wrong, where there are issues with the current government, where there are issues with Israeli policy, as friends of Israel, we speak plainly. At the same time, please understand this, Christian love for Israel today is shouting a message to the people of Israel, shouting a message to Jewish people worldwide, and it is going a long way to undoing some of the horrible anti-Semitism that has been present in church history over the centuries. This is a great opportunity for Christians to say, this is how we really feel as followers of Jesus. We are not anti-Semites, we are not Jew haters, quite the contrary. We recognize God's hands on Israel. We recognize God has brought the Jewish people back to the land. We recognize Satan wants to wipe Israel off the map, and therefore we stand with Israel against the devil. And at the same time, we care for everyone living in the region. That is our heart. So who is Hamas? Let's put this in right context here and listen to this together. In 1973, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, an Islamic cleric from Gaza, founded the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Fourteen years later, in 1987, Yassin founded the Islamic Resistance Movement, or Hamas, as the paramilitary wing of the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. Yassin founded Hamas with the help of Abdallah Azam, a highly influential Islamic thinker affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Azam, also known as the father of global jihad, was the mentor of Osama bin Laden and helped him create Al-Qaeda. The doctrines and aims of Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and ISIS, which emerged from Al-Qaeda, are all based on the teachings of Abdallah Azam. In fact, the sign above the door of the Hamas military academy in Gaza reads, Welcome to the Dr. Abdallah Azam Academy. Most people think that Hamas's goal is Palestinian independence, but the Hamas charter cites the words of the Prophet Muhammad, quote, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims fight the Jews. When the Jew will hide behind stones and trees, the stones and trees will say, O Muslims, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him, end quote. In other words, Hamas's founding document calls for genocide against the Jews. Hamas does not seek Palestinian independence. It seeks to exterminate the Jewish people and destroy Israel. Does Hamas represent the citizens of Gaza? 
In 2006, in a democratic election, Hamas won a majority 74 of 132 seats in Palestinian Legislative Council, the legislature of the Palestinian Authority, which governs the autonomous areas in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Hamas remains the majority of this legislature to this day. And ever since 2007, Hamas has total governing control of the Gaza Strip. According to the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research, in a study from 2021, 53% of Palestinians prefer Hamas leadership to that of Mahmoud Abbas, the more moderate head of the Palestinian Authority. And as recently as July 2023, polling by the Washington Institute shows that overall, 57% of Gazans express a positive opinion of Hamas, along with similar percentages of Palestinians in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. So, who is Hamas? Hamas has the same origins, beliefs, and goals as ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Hamas openly calls for genocide against Jews and the eradication of Israel. And Hamas is the democratically elected and preferred leadership of the people of Gaza. Yeah, the, the tragic thing is, friends, that the people of Gaza are, re, are in between a rock and a hard place. It's not like they have a leadership that says, hey, we're going to work side by side with Israel. There's going to be economic prosperity. Your children can have a future. They can travel freely and so on and so forth. They haven't had that option. And the more the war goes on and Israel's bombing, now Israel's going to look like the evil Israel, the terrible oppressor Israel. So it creates this horrific cycle. But if we go back a little while and we're going to dig even deeper in, in the rest of the broadcast and and and. Uh, put up more maps, which I'll uh, describe to everyone listening. Farid Zechariah, CNN, is not one that you'd say is a Palestinian basher and a, a blind, is just whatever Israel does is great. But listen to what he said in a recent interview. It's, it's really quite accurate historically. The problem is, uh, I think, Scott, that you put your, your, your finger on how to think about this, but what these people want more than anything else, as far as I can tell, is political rights and dignity. And the Israelis have been very willing uh, to give them a lot of other stuff, economic rights, development aid, the world has been willing to give them that. But it's almost as, this, as if we're trying to kind of obfuscate or get around the central problem, which is what they want is a state. And the Israelis, to be fair, have tried to go down that path as well. Not so much this government, but Ehud Barak, you remember 2000, Bill Clinton came all tantalizingly close to a Palestinian state. They had agreed on all the parameters, both sides. And then Yasser Arafat pulls out the last minute. Uh, Ehud Omert, another Israeli prime minister, offered a version of that deal again to M Abbas, the current Palestinian Authority leader. He turned it down. So the Palestinians, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for the Palestinians. I have, do not have a lot of sympathy for the Palestinian leadership, which has time and time again uh, just, you know, the way I would put it is fundamentally, there was a struggle here. Uh, the Israelis have won. The Israelis have won. They have, you know, they have all the territory. They're a rich, powerful, strong country. When you're in a war that you're losing, the longer you wait, the worse the deal you get. And the Palestinians have kept, if you think about it, the deal they were offered in 47, 48, the partition was half of, of, the, of, that, of that British mandate land. They said no. They, the, the Israelis take more. Then the 67 war happens. The Israelis take more. Now the settlement activity is taking place. The Israelis are. So what the deal that, that uh, Clinton offered, the, the, uh, Barack and, and Pal the Palestinians, is way better than anything they could dream of getting today. Because in a war when you're losing, the longer you wait, the worse the deal gets. And the leadership doesn't want to own up to its people that, you know, the dream of a loaf is gone. We have a half loaf. And if we keep pissing around, it's going to be 40% of the loaf. And then it'll be 30% of the loaf. And they just, you know, Palestinian leadership has a lot to, put, to, to answer for, in my view. Yeah. Absolutely agree with that. So when we come back, I'm going to go back to history, late 1800s, 
up through today, just key points to give you a context for the conflict. We care about everyone on the ground. We care about the people of Gaza. We care about the, we care about the people living in the West Bank. We care about every Israeli. What is truth? What is justice? What is right? What is accurate? Those are the big questions. Let's get the truth out together right here. Hey, friends, Dr. Michael Brown here. Do you remember when people thought I was crazy when I said it's not too late for America, that God can still do something in our country, that there is going to be a pushback, a gospel based moral and cultural revolution. And you remember when people thought that you were crazy because you felt the same way, because you believe what I was saying and already felt it in your heart. Well, friends, that pushback is here. The, the gospel based moral and cultural revolution we've been talking about for 25 years is unfolding and we are right in the thick of it. And the line of fire broadcast is divinely positioned for such a time as this. Friends, you would be so gratified and blessed as, as, as I hear, if you could hear what I hear, testimony after testimony as leaders, young people, old people, moms, dads, students, people from all backgrounds come up to me and say, Dr. Brown, you're providing a template for us. You're providing a blueprint for us. You're showing us how to do this, how to have hearts of compassion, backbones of steel. But friends, it's a joint effort. We do this together. And with your support, we can amplify this broadcast around the nation and amplify this voice to shake the nation. Join our support team today. Become a torchbearer with a dollar or more per day. Here's the number to call to sign up. 800-538-5275. That's 800 800- 538-5275 or go to askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org and become a monthly supporter. Click on donate monthly support. I want to immediately give you two classic books, Compassionate Father or Consuming Fire, Who is the God of the Old Testament and Revolution, which will really show you what it means to be a Jesus follower today. Plus, you get free access to our online classes and so much more. Sign up today, askdrbrown.org. This is how we rise up. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks for joining us on the Line of Fire. By the way, some watching on YouTube or Facebook say, why do you have all these interruptions? It's a live radio broadcast that you're watching. It's a live radio broadcast that has certain breaks and advertisers come in or we come in with our announcements. So that's that's the explanation for it. Just saw this tragic news. I don't know how many minutes ago, but just saw it now. Hundreds of people reportedly killed an explosion at the Ahli Arab Hospital in Gaza City on Tuesday evening there in, in Middle East time. Um, if accurate, absolute tragedy. You say, why would Israel do that? First, we don't know who did it. In other words, there were, uh, Hamas was shooting out right then a barrage of rockets towards Israel. Many of them fall short. This could easily be friendly fire. As I'm reading different reports, that's what is being suggested, that it was friendly fire. If it's Israel, it's absolutely contrary to what's intended. You have to realize, though, Hamas violates whatever war ethics there are and commits war crimes by using citizens as shield. All, all, everything they just did was war crime on, on every level. They're terrorists, that's, that's why. But if, if this actually happened, if a, a bomb from an Israeli fighter went astray and actually hit a hospital resulting in civilian casualties, that, that's a horror and the people of Israel will say it is a horror and will be mortified over it. They, they will not be dancing in the streets and celebrating, but it could well be friendly fire from Hamas. And you say, why is it that they're still launching rockets all over? How come Israel hasn't taken them all out? Because of where they're located, because of the civilian enclaves in which they're located or headquarters under a hospital and things like that. This is some of the, the moral dilemma that Israel faces in the midst of this war. But either way, tragedy, a, another tragedy, another tragic event, which is why early on, when we knew that Israel would have to go into Gaza and, uh, and eliminate Hamas from leadership after what happened a week ago Saturday, 
that we knew there would be terrible suffering for the people of Gaza. We had been praying for them as well and, and, and saying, urging Israel, as always, do whatever you can to avoid civilian casualties. So we know through history that as, as the Jewish people were scattered out of the land at different times and regathered and scattered again in the year 70 of this era and then 135, there was always a Jewish remnant that remained in the land. Uh, after the second century, the Romans renamed it. Uh, the name had been used here and there in, in earlier history, but they renamed the region Palestine to, to distance it from the Jewish people and to name it after their enemies, the Philistines. But there were always Jews that lived there. There was, there was always a presence, even if it was a small presence. And then, so you had different people ruling over the land with the rise of Islam, the Ottoman Empire, then that was, uh, they had rule over the area there. Then the Crusades, Christian forces took the land back. And they, so it's, it's been back and forth other, uh, under Islamic rule, then under Christian rule, then under the Ottoman Empire, just chronologically to say that more accurately. And then uh, after World War I, it came under the power of the British mandate. So there have been different ones ruling over it. We understand at no point has there been a Palestinian state, a Palestinian people, a Palestinian nationhood. There are those who have lived there for many centuries. There are those who've lived there in the land for many centuries. The vast majority of those who would identify as Palestinians today, the vast majority have not lived in the land for many centuries, but some have, and others have lived there the last 150 years. What happened in the late 1800s, this has nothing to do with colonization, this has nothing to do with Western powers. In the late 1800s, Aliyah, Jewish return to the land, began to increase more and more and more. With that, they were now buying up land from the Arabs that owned it and from others. They were buying up land. They were straining swamps, things like this, into the early 1900s. Many Jewish casualties from malaria draining, draining the swamps. Now, more Arabs are coming in. So the Arab population compared to the Jewish population, our population much bigger than the Jewish population in the late 1800s. But all over, all, all told, over the whole land, very, very small amounts compared to how many live there and now. We're just talking hundreds of thousands overall. So more Jews start coming in, developing the land. More Arabs come in because there's more work. And, and basically, things are fine. In other words, you're not at constant war. You're not in constant conflict. And, and there was room enough for people to be together in the land. But beginning in the late 1920s, hostilities arise with the Hebron massacre, where scores of Jews are massacred. And it, it, they lived in Hebron side by side with their Arab Muslim neighbors. And the, the one behind a lot of this, and it's the earliest intifada, is Haj Amin al-Husseini. He was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He ultimately became a, a confidant, a friend of Adolf Hitler. Uh, I want to read a couple of quotes. And, and he, he died in 1974. So uh, lived many years, but some of the initial incitement in the late 1920s is from a radical Muslim leader. So you've got plenty of Muslims who were dwelling side by side with Jews, secular Jews, religious Jews. They were not in conflict. I don't mean everything was perfect, but they were not at war. They were not in conflict. All right. So Hajami al Husseini, this is what he said. These are his sentiments. I declare a holy war, my Muslim brothers. Murder the Jews. Murder them all. So for radical Muslims, this has been a holy war for many decades. He also said this, Arabs, rise as one man and fight for your sacred rights. Kill the Jews wherever you find them. This pleases God, history, and religion. This saves your honor. God is with you. Okay, so let's go back in history again. The, the Balfour Declaration a little over 100 years ago, says there should be a homeland for the Jewish people. Under pressure from the Arab world, little by little, Britain pulls back from that. Ultimately, the Peel Commission comes up with a plan. And for those watching, we're going to put a map up again. So you may want to go over to YouTube later if you're listening. Go to the Ask Dr. Brown channel on YouTube, and you can actually look at this. So the Peel Commission in 1937 proposed a partition plan. And when you're looking at it, 
the the area that's in in light orange, that's the area that would belong to Israel. It would be split in in the middle. There would be a mandated zone under British control that would also oversee Jerusalem. And then the vast majority of it was like 75, 80 percent of the land would be for the the Arab population living there. So it was greatly debated among the Jews, greatly debated. Ultimately, the leadership said, yes, we, we'll accept this. It's, a, it's not a good deal. It's difficult, but we'll accept it. The Arab Muslim leadership said no. Just, just go back. This is, this is not disputed, what I'm saying here, okay? In terms of, of the Peel Commission, in terms of what was proposed, in terms of the response. It doesn't minimize the suffering of the people in Gaza today. It doesn't minimize the difficult situation for, for those living in Judea, Samaria, known as the West Bank. It doesn't minimize that. It does not exonerate everything Israel does today. That's not my point. My point is going back through history, there would have been a two-state solution, miserably bad for the Jews, but still, hey, we're back in our homeland. They accepted it. Let me, let me read some quotes that are representative from this time period, all right? Uh, Let's go to Haj Amin al Husseini, 1936. 1936, so one year before the Peel Commission. There is no place in Palestine for two races. The Jews left Palestine 2,000 years ago. Let them go to other parts of the world where there are wide, vacant places. Here's what David Ben Gurion said, 1937. We do not wish and we do not need to expel Arabs and take their place. All our aspiration is built on the assumption, proven throughout all our activity in the land of Israel, that there is enough room in the country for ourselves and the Arabs. This is 1937. Azam Pasha. Uh, hang on. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just pause there before I get to this next one. So that was the Peel Commission. The proposal was rejected. Now you have more conflicts between the, the local Jewish community and, and the local Arab community. They weren't known as Palestinians then. In fact, the, the Palestinian Symphony Orchestra was Jewish. The Palestine Post was the Jerusalem Post. These were, these were Jewish. So Jews were taking on the identity as Palestinians. And yes, this had been the homeland for a small number of Arabs who, again, did not identify as Palestinians because there was not a Palestinian state. They, they had lived there some four centuries and were proud of their homeland. But that was, that was the minority compared to the numbers today. This was a, a small group of people, relatively speaking. And then others had been there decades. Either way, it became their home. It, it was all, all clear, all clear. So the leaders reject this. Now you have more infighting. Now with the Holocaust and Britain not allowing Jewish refugees to come into the land. I mean, this is utterly horrific, but this is what happened. They could have escaped. They could have made it into land, but they could not get in. They were not allowed in. So this was not a place where they could take refuge. Just one of the horrible stories in modern history. Uh, and now, now there is fighting. Now you have Jewish resistance groups fighting against the Arabs, fighting against Britain. There are assassinations going back and forth. Read the early history of America fighting against Great Britain for, in our revolution. It's a lot of that is parallel. However, after the horrors of the Holocaust, now a partition plan is drawn up by the UN. So for those who are watching, we'll put this up as well, this picture. So the UN draws up a partition plan in 1947. And in this plan, uh, it's, it's um, more favorable to the Jewish people. But when you look at what was offered Still, the great majority, so not as good as the Peel Commission offer, but the great majority is still under Arab control. Jerusalem is still going to be under now UN now, international oversight. Uh, at its narrowest, you've just got a few miles where uh, when you look at the map, you think, how in the world is this defensible? But these are the pre-1967 borders. And it was accepted. It was accepted by the Jewish leadership. Yes, we accept this, declaring independence in 1948 after the UN vote. The Arab Muslim leadership said no. Here are some of the representative quotes. We go to 1947, October 11th, Azam Pasha, who is Secretary General of the Arab League, he said this, it will be a war of annihilation. It will be a momentous massacre in history that will be talked about like the massacres of the Mongols or the Crusades. 
Now, we'll contrast that with what Jewish leadership was saying. Yes, you had soldier groups, different ones fighting back and forth with each other. This was going on. But at this point now, this is a war for survival on the heels of the Holocaust. There could have been a two-state solution if the Muslim leadership had accepted it. If you want more insight on this, read the book Palestine Betrayed by Ephraim Karsh. Palestine Betrayed, the fault, five, the fault lies at the feet of the Islamic leadership, the Arab leadership over the people and the people have suffered ever since. I'm Paul Burnett, a board certified doctor of holistic health. Over the years, I have helped countless people increase and maintain their natural energy production with Alfred Libby's Slow Dissolve Super B12 sold only by Trivita. I have never met anyone deficient in caffeine or sugar, but I have met many people deficient in energy-supporting vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is one of the eight B vitamins and is an essential nutrient, meaning the body cannot make B12 on its own. You see, unlike other oral B12 supplements, Alfred Libby's Slow Dissolve Super B12 is fast acting because the formula is scientifically developed to dissolve under the tongue, bypassing the digestive process, making it immediately available for use in the body. Alfred Libby's Slow Dissolve Super B12 is also formulated with other natural energy supporting ingredients such as folate, ginseng root, and other natural ingredients. Not only are the ingredients beneficial for energy, but they also support healthy cognition, mood, nerve function, and natural hemoglobin production. You deserve to live with greater energy and mental clarity. And now, like millions of others, you can with Alfred Livy's Slow Dissolve Super B12, sold only by your wellness partner, Trivita. To order Alfred Libby's B12 for yourself, call 1-800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. Order today and use promo code BROWN25 to receive 25% off your order. As a new customer, 100% of your order proceeds from your first order will go to support the Line of Fire radio broadcast. Call 1-800-771-5584. 1-800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the Line of Fire. Uh, you know what? I, I don't think I'm going to get to calls and it, it takes courage to call in and, and differ with me anyway, so it's not like the phone lines have been lighting up. But let me, let me go back into history, all right? So we know what the Muslim Arab leadership was saying. And, and again, as Farid Zechariah said, it is the, the failure of the Palestinian leadership. That's, that's the real issue here. So Golda Meir, November 29th, 1947. This is what she says with the announcement of the partition plan, partition plan, et cetera. We are happy and ready for what lies ahead. Our hands are extended in peace to our neighbors. Both states can live in peace with one another and cooperate for the welfare of their inhabitants. David Ben-Gurion, December 1947. If the Arab citizen will feel at home in our state, if the state will help him in a truthful and dedicated way to reach the economic, social, and cultural level of the Jewish community, then Arab distrust will accordingly subside and a bridge will be built to a Semitic Jewish Arab alliance. The Haganah, so Israeli Defense Force, circulated these um, communications in its Arabic language broadcasting communications. The Haganah consistently articulated the same message. Hey, we can live side by side. And if you're Arabs living in what's going to become a Jewish state, we can live side by side. Uh, April 22nd, at the height of the fighting in Haifa, the Haganah distributed an Arabic language circular noting its ongoing campaign to clear the city of all criminal foreign bans so as to allow the restoration of peace and security and good neighborly relations among all of the town's inhabitants. 
And they said this, we implore you again to keep your women, children, and the elderly from the dangerous places and to keep yourselves away from gang bases that are still subject to our retaliatory action. We do not wish to shed the innocent blood of the city's peace-loving inhabitants. On April 24th, another Haganah radio broadcast declared, Arabs, we do not wish to harm you. Like you, we only want to live in peace. If the Jews and the Arabs cooperate, no power in the world will ever attack our country or ignore our rights. Jamal Husseini, speaking to the UN Security Council on April 16th, 1948, said this, the representative of the Jewish agency told us yesterday that they were not the attackers, that the Arabs had begun the fighting. We did not deny this. We told the whole world that we were going to fight. So please understand that Arab leadership, this is not indicting all Arabs or all Muslims. No, no, it's, it's leaders that have hurt the people. The leadership in 1937 said no to a two-state solution that would have been overwhelmingly in their favor. And remember, no one owned the land in terms of this is our historic state, these are our historic borders. It had been governed by others. It was considered part of greater Syria at, at times and things like that. And we said it was under Islamic control, Christian control, Ottoman Empire, British mandate, etc. So it, and, and land that was owned, Jews were, Jews were buying. So there, there was room for everybody. The offer in 1937 refused. That's a fact. Go study it, Peel Commission. The partition plan of the UN and recognizing Israel's Jewish state refused. So it was 1947, 1948. And what happens once, Israel, once the partition plan is announced, the attacks begin from the surrounding Arab Muslim nations. And then when Israel declares its independence, the, the attacks intensify. So Israel's now right fresh out of the Holocaust is now fighting for its survival once again. The, these are realities. These are realities. You say, yeah, well, Israel create, committed war crimes. When you look back at history and get past the myth to the actual fact, yes, there were atrocities committed, but this, the, the war was conducted on a higher ethical level than you normally see in war. And to this day, Israel is accountable because of its, its own ethical policies to conduct war on a higher ethical level. And when you, when you just compare apples to apples, Israel comes out extremely well historically in terms of how it has conducted its war. So, yes, you have assassins on each side. You have freedom fighters on each side. You have people that think they're on the right side. Uh, we understand that. All I'm saying is look at the larger context. There could have been a two-state solution massively unfavorable to the Jews in 1937. They accepted it. The Arab leadership rejected it. 1947, 1948 more favorable, Jews accepted it, Arab Muslim leadership rejected it. So these are realities. You say, well, no, we just want peace now. Hang on. Are you one of those chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free? That means no more Israel. From the river, as we've said before, that's the Jordan River in the east, to the sea, that's the Mediterranean Sea on the west, is Palestine will be free. That means no Israel. That means no recognition of Israel. That means these marches all around the world are saying no Israel. There can be no Israel. There can be no Jewish presence there. That's what it is. It is Psalm 83, as, as you'll see Rabbi Wolicki on Thursday, we'll get into this. The, the enemies of Israel saying we'll wipe them out so their name doesn't exist anymore. These enemies rise up through history. Did Jesus die for all these people? Yes. Jesus died for the Nazis as well. Jesus died for ISIS leaders as well. Jesus died for drug traffickers and human traffickers as well. He died for every single one of us. And we all sin and fall short and need God's grace and mercy. It doesn't mean that, that the Nazis weren't evil and that it was right to bomb them and destroy them so that they stopped taking other lives. It, it doesn't mean that ISIS wasn't evil and, and it's, it wasn't right to destroy ISIS. It doesn't mean that Hamas is not evil and it's not right to uh, destroy Hamas. No, th there are righteous actions and if you don't believe in this, just get rid of all police, get rid of all police, get rid of all armies, and see what happens to the world. All right. Fast forward to 1967. Israel's about to be attacked in a massive attack, takes preemptive strike to, to at least defend itself, and in the midst of it, captures more territory. So it expands its reach. That's what happens in war. Some of the borders of America, borders of many countries around the world, that's how they are what they are that they fought in war 
and they took territory. Remember, this was not an offensive war. This was Israel about to be attacked in a massive way, saying, okay, we have to try to undercut this so that we're not wiped out, because that was the goal. The goal was not a two-state solution. There was a two-state solution. Please understand that. When Yasser Arafat launched the second intifada after the, the best arrangements that could have possibly been made in so many ways to say, okay, here's how you have your own state, here's this, this, and here's all the money we, we want to pay you to, to try to help you get started. It, it, all of this, America, Israel, working together, Yasser Arafat starts the second intifada. This was not about a Palestinian state. The Palestinian state was being offered. It was saying there can be no Jewish state. That's the reality. That's where the evil is. That's where the one-sidedness is, and it has been historically. So now, what does Israel do with the, quote, occupied territories? It gives Gaza back to the Palestinians, and they promptly elect Hamas, which his charter says we must obliterate Israel. Israel must be destroyed by Islam, and the final war will not come in, until the Muslims fight against the Jews and destroy them. So this is their ideology. We've talked about that on the air. We played a clip earlier about, about who they are, what their ideology is. Thousands of rockets were fired against Israel before Israel really began to attack back in more serious ways. And everything Hamas just did is what they have wanted to do for years and years and years and years and years. This is nothing new. So that's, that's on the one side. Occupied territories, it would be called West Bank, Judea, Samaria. Israel now has taken this back through war, through fighting against combatants that wanted to wipe them off the map. That's the reality. Are all of Israel's policies good and fair in the territories? No. Is the present government guilty of inciting certain things? And are there violent Jewish settlers? Yes. Are there things that I would differ with in terms of how Israel responds in certain situations? Yes. Are you going to have individual Israeli soldiers, maybe a number of them that don't treat the Palestinians there fairly? Yes, all this happens. We can address this as friends of Israel and supporters of Israel. But know that the adage still remains true, that if the Palestinians put down their weapons, if they weren't teaching their kids to be terrorists, that the state-run TV wasn't putting out the propaganda, if their elementary schools weren't named after uh, Palestinian Muslims who blew themselves up, killing Israeli children after the martyrs. If, if this wasn't the case, then things would be different. Even though Mahmoud Abbas has been more friendly towards Israel in many ways, you still do not have among the people this whole, let's, let's live in harmony, or there'll be no more threat to the Jewish state. That's not the reality. So we need to pray for divine intervention and divine wisdom and, and for the reality of the situation to be grasped, Israel is not going anywhere and Israel will not put itself in a situation where its national security can be violated again. Is the current government responsible for the security lapses? Yes. Are there many things for which Netanyahu can be faulted? Many would say yes. Many would say that his government has folks so focused, the security so focused on the West Bank that they took their eyes off Gaza and that's because of the Jewish settlers there, etc. We, we, can, we can lay blame wherever we lay it, but just to understand, Israel must deal with Hamas. And Israel has been the one over the decades saying yes to the different proposals, yes, yes, and this is what they get in return. These are historical realities, friends, regardless of which side of the debate you fall on. And there could have been a two-state solution on different occasions, at least three or four different occasions, if not for the bad decisions and even corrupt decisions of Palestinian Islamic leadership. Pray for the people who have been victims. And remember, the tiny minority, Christian Palestinians within Israel, do not speak for their nation as a whole. They would have a much more conciliatory, gracious approach. They do not speak for their peoples as a whole. As we pray for them, they're often especially stuck between a rock and a hard place.